I wanted to add something to my last video, which is about loss leaders and blended margins. In the last video, I talked about ta -da, this, which is how um, product flows from the maker to the customer through different, these are called channels, sales channels, and how the profit breaks down with each. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. I did this illustration, it's cute. Um, but one might wonder why one would get involved in this relationship, for example, which is the grocery store working with a distributor. Oh my gosh, I forgot one other sequential layer and I don't even know, I don't think I have a pen that will convey how this is. I guess this one. Okay, there's another layer and I'm excited to do this because this is this is just gonna show you exactly how how crazy it is for small makers to do this work. Okay, so here we go. And this is just a lot to think about. I mean, you gotta keep this stuff in mind. Okay, there's a grocery store taking its, um, you know, making uh, its 60% or, you know, a 40% margin. And there's the distributor taking its bet. Before we get to a distributor, we work with a broker. And actually, this is not an exact graph because the broker uh, works directly with the grocery store often too. And then also the distributor has their own reps or you can hire additional reps. The broker takes just a few percent, six to 10, and they, represent your product to grocery stores and to and then they then they put the order in for to the distributor put to ship to the grocery store it is a convoluted thing but in case you're wondering why any maker in their right mind would sign up for this let me explain to you blended margins which is something that we've been kind of checking out and experimenting with blended margins mean that you'll still sell to these people because you know that some percentage of these people are going to become these customers and they as you know for example as we know that people are going to the grocery store less and less they're going to have seen your product on the shelf and then they will check to see if it's on amazon sometimes if they read your packaging if you've designed your packaging in a way that's fun and exciting and everything They'll read your packaging, this actually happened to us, and they will show up at your shop. Um, two years ago, some fa a whole family um, came by our little shop on Main Street. We weren't even open. We didn't have a storefront. We just That was where our manufacturing facility was. And they found our address on the side of the box, which you can see our boxes here. So they had pitched picked up this at Whole Foods. They found our address on the side of the, on the back of the box and they said, oh, we're gonna be going by Colfax. Let's stop by the Outlaw Soaps people. They look fun. And so they just showed up and it was so cool to meet this family that had found our soap on the, on the shelf of Whole Foods um, and just wanted to come by. So we showed them like, you know, we of course invited them in and gave them like the whole tour. We're like, oh gosh, you're the customers that showed up, how cool. So um, that was really exciting. But yeah, so some percentage of, if you get in enough grocery stores, having a broker is great because this is a very, very complex relationship. And they have sales and you know, there's different ways of doing chargebacks and scanbacks and refreshes and free fill and uh, coupons and you know, I mean, I'm telling you, like, already uh, Procter & Gamble is planning their coupons for probably 2020, um, at least 2019, I know for a fact, because deadlines are coming up for that. So when you're working with a broke, like a lot of grocery stores, you need to get a broker so that your broker can make sure that all the orders are getting placed correctly, all that the, you know, making sure that there's no low movement on any of your SKUs, stock keeping units, that's uh, a SKU is a stock keeping unit, unit. and so they, they manage that relationship, but, but for us, for example, that would mean that we would actually probably lose money on, on hiring a broker, which is too bad because, you know, they're, they're, they would be very helpful, but this relationship is already a very tough one for us because we're so small. 
and our profit margins just aren't big enough to handle this really. So as you can see, this is very interesting. Um, so blended margins are basically taking all of these margins into consideration and thinking of this as more of an ecosystem rather than selecting each channel. I come from a world where we, we focus on each channel and I believe in the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule, which is that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. And that's borne out for us. And that is also borne out for us in terms of this, which is that 80% of our sales come from 20% of our channels. And that would be right here. That would be these. And that's Amazon and our website. Absolutely true. And so if you think in terms of that, then you might say, well, efficiency should say that we get rid of all the channels that are not the giving us 80% of our sales. And I think that that is a very conscientious and wise business decision. But it's not the decision that we made because we want to be everywhere. Like we want people to see us everywhere. We, we want to eventually be a household name. And in order to be a household name, we need to be in grocery stores. We need to be on Amazon. We need to be in small grocery stores and big grocery stores and in small retail boutiques and in big retail chains. We need to be all these places. So that's blended margins. You look at the entire bottom line instead of the individual bottom lines. There you go. All right, now you know. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you want me to answer any other questions. It is my joy to serve you.